my name's Richard. Welcome to We're Not Wizards. And this is a getting out and about episode, which is a new one. And you're going like, <gasps> he's spinning a new ones. It's not Friends of the Show. Well, it's kind of Friends of the Show. But it's getting out and about. Yup, because sometimes you got to get out of there and get into the open air and mingle with other people. Not just people you go at the group. So joining me today is Mr. David Wright. Mr. David Wright is from Tabletop Scotland. And what's Tabletop Scotland, may you ask? Well, Mr. David Wright is going to tell us all about Tabletop Scotland after he tells us a little bit about himself. So, hey Dave, thank, thank you, you for Mr. coming on. I'm very, very good. I'm very, very good. We've uh, we've known each other for a little little while now. Yes, we because, have, yes. Because you um, you are a person that partakes in the dwarf. I am indeed. I am indeed. <laughs> uh, we, we, share, we share a dwarf from time to time. <laughs> I don't mean that just came out wrong. Um, <laughs> That's the first, the first non-edit of the show. Um, <laughs> um, for everybody who's joining us for the first time, um, the reason that we do this is because we quite simply believe there's not enough podcasts out there about board games. There's actually only a couple of us in Scotland as well. There is us. There's the Unlucky Frog Gaming Podcast, which I believe you've been on recently, sir. You have indeed. Um, and there's also the first player token, who we still haven't spoken to. It's terrible. It is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> the other reason that we do this is uh, because there has been a plethora of uh, board game related kind of conferences that are going to be on this year. It's almost impossible not to, for a month not to go by. Um, where there's not going to be some kind of gathering of people who are all going to be talking about cardboard and other such related beautiful things. So when Dave said, listen, do you know what Tabletop Scotland is? And I went, no. He sat me down and he told me, and I thought, well, we had to get him on so we can tell all of you about it. But before we do that, we always like to find out a little bit of history about our latest uh, about our latest lovely guests. So we're going to have a little peek back in the past. We're going to have a little focus on the present before we stare off into the massive queues outside <laughs> the conference of the future. Do you like that? I do. Um, um, do you want to, I mean, do you want to tell us? You've got a, you've got quite a long, <laughs> a long I've got, I do have <laughs> quite a long history. Yeah, thank you, thank you for making me <laughs> older. But, um. <laughs> what are you talking about? Uh, I'm not an old man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 41. I can just call you man. Uh, but you could have well. called me Dave. <laughs> um, oh dear. Um, yeah, okay, so history. I got into the hobby when I was. Oh, I see the hobby, and I suppose you could classify that. Role playing games was my first love. Um, and I started role playing at the tender age of 11, and this would oh. have been now 33 years ago. Um, so a while um, with Dungeons and Dragons, the red box set at the wow. UK, which was um, my brother Alan got it. I then stole it from him. Um, <laughs> which and the rest is history. No, um, I think <laughs> uh, for the first kind of uh, six seven years of of the hobby, I was a role player primarily. I played yeah. a bit of board games. Um, the GW, the Games Workshop hobby, kind of kicked off at that point as well. But I. I never got into that at all. I played Blood Bowl. I played a few of their, their board games like Chiefs of Warrior. But it was it was always role playing games I kind of went back to. Um, and then you kind of get to an age where you think, oh, I need to go to university now, or or I need to do something. <laughs> yeah. So when I went to, and I, and I find people sit in two camps: they either discover the hobby at the university or college or whatever, or yeah. they go there and then stop when they get there uh, for a period of time. And I, and I was yeah. in the latter camp. I just kind of stopped gaming for no real reason other than I didn't have time for it, probably because I was doing other things, which we just went to. Being, being cool and hanging well, out on campus. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Doing all the exciting, cool stuff. And watching, uh, the, watching the pretty people walking past and you just throwing the red box of D&D to one side. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and yes, and want to be one of them or something. Like that. Um, yeah, and I think it was after uni that uh, when I actually didn't have money, <laughs> that I was like, "All right, okay, I've got this hobby that I would like to rekindle." Um, and 
uh, we were living in Glasgow at the time and I started to buy lots and lots of role-playing games and not playing them and lots and lots of board games and playing them irregularly and at that point we then decided to leave Glasgow and I had all, I had literally, I don't know, about 200 plus role-playing books and stuff Whoa. like that and it was just like, I'm not taking all this to, to where we are now um, and you know, in it was just like, what's the point in that? Um, so I got rid of it all. All of it. Every single part of the hobby went away. And we, 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 we need to give we need yeah. to give a little bit of silence for people to take that in. Yeah, that's a lot. Do you have any regrets about that at all? Do you have any <sighs> Not really. Not really, because mm. it's it's one of these things. It's I think what what I developed um at that point was a kinda it's a bit of a mantra with me is uh, I don't stick to it all the time, I hasten to add, but it's, I'm only going to buy something if I'm going to use it. Yeah. Um, now, that's primarily in the, the hobby, by the way, not in this story, everything <laughs> in life. Um, but um, but uh, board, board games, card games, and role-playing games, I try and only buy it if I think, yeah, I can see me playing that within the next 6, 12 months, something yeah, like that. Yeah. Although, looking at my board game shelves, I do have stuff that's not been played and I've had it for over a year. So, yeah, I'm really? not quite sticking to that. Um <laughs> But yeah, literally, uh, not long after moving to where we are, I discovered a gaming group in Edinburgh, um, and I then started role-playing in Edinburgh every other Saturday. And it was, as I say, still role-playing at this point, and then doing a bit of a bit of board gaming now and again, but while I was role-playing. And then we get to the one of the kind of sadder moments of my hobby. I opened a game store, which is the nice happy thing, right? A nice happy thing. Uh-huh. But then two and a half years later, I closed the affirmation game store because it wasn't making any money yeah. um and it was really about not long after that that i was like right okay this is this is still a part of me this hobby is a part of me i'd like to rekindle it and it was through board games that, that i managed to do that um i still role play not very often but i still do it yeah and, but board games is the primary and as you as you know and as i'm assuming most of your listeners know board, board games have such a huge growth in the last kind of five, kind of six, seven years, even um, the explosion of titles, the availability of them, and stuff like that is just amazing. And as my shelves attest, uh, there's there's lots of them out there. Wait, I mean, why role playing? I mean, what is it you like about role playing? I mean, we talk about a lot of card yeah. all the time, and very. I mean, we have spoken to folk that have done like kind of, you know, Colin. Told off of his of his larping tales, and we had uh, and Tracy on from Chaos Cards, you know, talking very, about very you know, clear. I'm, I'm very clear. I'm not a larper. Never have been. Colin, <laughs> Colin, Colin's special, and you know, Colin's special, and we all love him in our own way. Why role playing? Uh, I I like storytelling, um, and I was invariably the person who would run the game uh, because I would enjoy storytelling and reacting to the players. The other, you know, the other players' actions and activities. Yeah, and I'm a fantasy geek, so D and D, the Dragons, is an easy thing for me to go. Oh, yeah, it's a great fun. Um, and I've played every edition of D and D. I even played D and D at Gen Con in 2014, and I hope to play it again at Gen Con this year because I'm going again. Ooh, um, nice. And that that's it's it's always been a kind of core part of the hobby for me. Um, and I have lots of D and D board games as well. Funnily enough. Lords of Water Deep, Towers Under Dark, Salt of the Giants, stuff like that. Um, do you get Do you get quite into it? I mean, are you the type of person that kind of do you get into kind of like putting on the voices and putting on the weird faces, or do you kind of let the players make up the kind of the you let them leave their imagination to it? Because I've seen two types in the club. I've seen the guys that will sit there and go, "And you've entered a cave and it's covered in bees. What do you do?" <laughs> And then you get some I've people that go, well, what, that you find you in know, caves. You... They're really troublesome. <laughs> um, they um, I, 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 I tend to see they how always the roll players, advantage. Yeah, I tend to see how the players, how the players are playing because uh, different groups, um, and I've run for lots of different groups, um, and including the uh, members of my team for Tabletop Scotland, and yeah. um, and the, you know, if, if if a player wants to do that, then I'll play off it, and I'll and I'll kind of. Encourage them to do it as well, but it's it's not it's not an important part of the hobby, not for me at least, for role playing at least, not for me. Yeah. Um, I mean, I've run at conventions, I've run for complete strangers, I've <laughs> run for people that I've known for twenty plus years, and it's kind of like it doesn't. It, it's it depends really on the kind of 
how, how the group is the group dynamics working. Certainly, when you're playing for strangers, you, you don't yeah. really know how to gauge that until like 20 minutes, half an hour into the game. Yeah. And everyone's kind of settled in. Um, but for a regular group, I, I wouldn't go. I, I would do the odd silly voice, perhaps, depending upon what's happening. Uh, yeah. But it's more just kind of let's see what chaos they can create and try and not kill them off too quickly type stuff. Uh, because <laughs> normally it's a self-destructive path they take. Do you change it between kind of encounters and, and kind of storytelling? Because I know some I know some people that run a campaign to kind of almost tell the story. They're like an easy mode on a video game. If you want to experience the story and don't want to come up to too much hassle, then select this option. And you get people that they're very good, they tell the story, they tell the tale, and they're almost like part of this tale, and it's almost difficult for them to almost fail. Or you get, you know, you meet in a tavern, a fight a fight breaks out. Yeah, and, and, I mean, it, 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 it'll de- again, it kind of depends on what it is. If it's a one-shot scenario, that I mean, I've, I've run quite a few run- one-shots. I ran one recently in, in Nottingham. I went down to an event in Nottingham for charity. They were a superhero game. Uh, that I hadn't run before and I'd owned it for eight years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was one of the few things... No, it didn't survive the cull when we left Glasgow. It was one of the things I bought when oh, right. we moved here. And it was kind of like, right, I've never ran this before. And at Expo uh, last year, um, I got into a chat about, right, okay, what games have you not read, uh, ran? And I said, Brave New World by Matt Forbeck. And they were like, oh, you should run that. And I was like, yeah, I should run that, didn't I? <laughs> Um, and then, <laughs> and then this what event materialised, and I stupidly put my hand up for it. But anyway, no. Uh, but that that was that was because that was a one shot. It was kind of like you have to start into the action. You have to give the player something to engage with immediately. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, it's quite passive. If you're running a campaign, then or 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 even a multi session story, um, then it's really a case of well, let's see what happened last time. It could it can go slow. It can go fast. It can be high octane, full of explosions, or it can just be, or it can be very narrative based. It really depends on on the story. I mean, I I ran a D and D game in Edinburgh for two and a half years that I'd say probably that less than thirty percent of the sessions actually had um, a lot of combat in them because a lot of it was story driven. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what the players wanted. Have you got a favourite edition of D and D then? If you've had, and it sounds like you've played every edition is there like ones that you kind of hold are you like oh the advanced stuff's the best or what do you think of the current edition just now are you like kind of really loving that or have, have you got a, as, as a one that you would if somebody says right you're allowed one rule book what do you take with you yeah I, I mean there is I mean I would, I would go first edition advanced Dungeons and Dragons um, it's, the, it's the version of D&D that I cut my teeth on mm-hmm. um, it's the version of D&D that I played the most I am, however, a huge fan of the new edition. It's uh, I, I can't remember who it was. There was a, a D and D blogger uh, called Chatty DM. I can't remember his real name, but he he did a he did a kind of review of fifth edition just as it came out, and I think he got uh, preview copies and stuff like that. And he basically said it's like D and D's greatest hits. They've taken all the good bits from the various previous editions and they've sliced and diced them and chucked them together, and it works. And he's right; it does. It's it's great. I, I think I think it is the best um, edition of D and D mechanically. Uh, it mm-hmm. hangs together really well. It's it's you know it, there's there's a lot going on in the game that you can do. A very flexible system. Um, but if I was to choose one, I'd probably go back to first edition of D and D just because mm-hmm. from a nostalgia perspective, for no other reason. Yeah. It'd be like putting on your... It's like finding an old sweater you really liked and just sticking it back on and going, this looks good still, and I s- kind of can pull it off. I don't uh, look uh, completely uh, ridiculous. It's it still fits you. Yeah, all these years <laughs> exactly. You have to go around breathing in all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, I told, I told you I could get back in this. <laughs> if you pass out on the floor from exactly. like lack of oxygen. Um, would you... Or have you ever considered actually putting together your own little system? I mean, has the experience that you had, um, have you kind of like thought, well, I could actually do a little bit of this. There could be the kind of my little system. Kind of, have you done that? Have you kind of played around with kind of bringing in uh, changes yeah. and mods to stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of tinker with games that I'm running. Um, so I 
I, I, I'm not a, the term rules is written. So in our words, how how it's actually written in the book is how you run it. And I'm not that kind of player of a, of a role playing game or, yeah. or, or, or DM or whatever. I tend to tweak it slightly. Um, largely because I don't want to continuously refer back to the rule book uh, because that breaks the suspension of disbelief as you're playing the game. And one of the things for them made reference to Baby World earlier on, the superhero game. Um, and Matt, hope, if he ever listens, Matt Forbitt listens to this, hopefully he forgives me saying this, but the mechanics for Brave New World, it was written in 1999, are awful. Um, <laughs> so, so I ripped it apart and, and rebuilt them from scratch. Well, he's on next week, so I can tell him. <laughs> I, I, I have promised to send him my feedback because he is planning to do a second edition of the game. Well, that'd he, be cool. he still owns the rights. So I have said to him, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. And he was great for it as well. It's like D2 here, but he, I just messaged him and said, you've got a convention scenario for this, surely. You must have. And he was like, yeah, here's the convention scenario. And I was like, that's like 10 lines. He was like, that's all you need. <laughs> I was like, you know what? You're not wrong. 10 lines and a map, and you can just wing it for the rest of it. Um, and that, and that, that's essentially what I did um, uh, when I went down to Nottingham. But I, I completely rebuilt that mechanically for me. To, so that it was something I felt familiar with. So it's got, you know, elements of the original game, but it's also got elements of other games. Mm-hmm. But okay. I've never had an aspiration to be a game designer. It's never been something from scratch. I've never had that inclination. It's not been. It's not really been a calling. Probably for good reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you had the sh- when you had the shop, um, d- I mean, is there spaces? Do you, do you think there's spaces for kind of like retail board game? establishments or do they have to kind of be a mixture of kind of social space at the same time because all the ones that i see the new ones that are um that seem to be opening up i mean as i say chaos cards have opened up their own store but it still seems to concentrate on having a large social space that people can go into you've got is it common grounds in sterling again They've got almost like this is what you can buy, but this is what you can eat and sit down and have a and have a game. Yeah, in, in psychology, there's a term called the third space or the third or the third place, and and so you've got your home and you've got your work, and for people, uh, you've got a third place as well. Um, not everyone has one, but you know, it tend, there tends to be that kind of psychological thing of another place you're comfortable to go to, mm-hmm. um, and there's a. I'm going to go all, psych, all, all, all fancy down on you here. There's a guy in, in the States called uh, Gary Ray who does a blog um, about his store in California uh, called Black Diamond Games. And he's he's been blogging about retail, hobby retail, for, uh, I don't know, 12, 13 years. And, yeah. it's, and I read it every time, every post I read it, I, I digest it, even though I, I have no plans to go back into hobby retail it's very interesting stuff and he writes a lot about the third space i think um to develop um that kind of community aspect to give people a reason to buy from you you need to offer them something more if you can if you if you think about anything that you can buy in your brick and mortar retail store where yeah. where the community space or not um the question that, that tends to come up is well, what pricing strategy do you have as a brick and mortar store? Well, you know what, you can't compete with an online retailer on price. So how can you compete? Um, you have to give people a reason to want to buy from you. I mean, I'm I'm I tend to buy almost everything from brick and mortar stores because partly because I used to be one, I suppose. But yeah. I like to support them. I like to make sure they still exist for a variety of reasons. I think I think having space. Builds that community, builds that connection. Um, I mean, you've mentioned Steve uh, coming around the Stubborn, uh, Steve's store. There's, um, in fact, I'll, I'll mention a few stores just now. Yeah, sure, yeah, let's give some shout outs to some. Um, of the, so, some, yeah. we've got three stores confirmed who are definitely coming to trade at the, the convention. One of them, um, which is probably obvious to most that they would be there, but it's, it's you know, let's, 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 let's give them their place. Big Dog Books, so Stuart Kane, who owns Big Dog Books in Perth, so the local game and comic shop in Perth is going to be at the convention. And Stuart's got uh, a good community in his store, a strong community store from a comic book and a gaming perspective. And he has game nights uh, most mm. nights of the week. Um, 
Then you've got Settlers in Hamilton, which is run by Shaz, uh, who I've known for a few years now, um, um, since before I had the store. And um, Shaheen's, um, he's very keen to be at the convention. So he's, I don't know if you've been to Settlers, it's, if you even look at the photographs on, the, on, the, on his Facebook page, the store's much bigger than the photographs give you. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's a great store. He's, he's doing really well. I'm, I'm very chuffed with him. And then we've got West End Games in Glasgow who are going to be coming as well. Um, Ross, who owns West End Games, um, they they have they've kind of grown out of nothing in the last kind of three years, I think it is, um, and they're doing really well as well, which is great. So it, those are three retailers that we have confirmed. We are talking to others yeah. um, because we do want to have a reasonable spread geographically as well um, of, of retailers, but others can't do it. And I think completely segueing into Tabletop Scotland stuff here, but I think one of the things I've been able to bring to the convention is that engagement with the retailers having been one. So I can sit down with them and I've done that with most of them um, yeah. and actually chatted it through and just said, look, I know this may not be it may not sound like commercially always the right thing to do, or it might be the sort of thing you don't have a marketing budget for. Um, so just tell me that, <laughs> and, I, and I won't, I won't take it the wrong way. Um, but it's it's really good that, um, that the guys who have confirmed have, and that's great. And I say we, we may have one or two uh, more on top of that, and we're just working that through, um, which is which is exciting because even just having that kind of breadth of retailer across Scotland. Is, is really positive. There's so many game stores now in Scotland, it's it's quite, you know, it's impressive. Um, I'm surprised that there's so many. And they're all doing pretty well, which is really good as well. And just to say, just to reiterate, if anybody is out there who has a game store and they want to come on and have a chat, give us a shout. Happy to always speak to people involved in the hobby, regardless of what part of the hobby that they're in. But, I mean, you're cruising along, you're obviously you've got the um is it you're running a you're running a club is it on Sundays up at is it East Nuke? Yeah, you're so a club. in Anstruther yeah. on the second and so yeah, so that that kind of came out of nothing. Um I was so I, I game in Dwarf as you know, so two of us do that. Yeah. Um yeah. I used to game in Edinburgh on a Saturday, but I stopped that after her daughter was born because yeah. I just I just couldn't give up my Saturdays for that. Um, no. So I now give up my Sundays. So that's a bit weird. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> so about um, about four years ago, um, I think I was off sick from work or something like that, and I was bored, and I was just doing some random Twitter searches, which I'm sure you do all the time. Um, and and I stumbled, never on it, never on Twitter, <laughs> never. Uh, it must be Colin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I I was doing some random Twitter searches uh, in, in the kind of East Nuke area, and just saying, right, okay, just what is there on Twitter? you know, in this area. And up pops a picture of Kingdom, uh, King of Tokyo. And I'm just like, with the hashtag oh. Anstruther. And I'm like, all right, who in Anstruther plays King of Tokyo? Um, and, <laughs> just and what I'm, random and thing I'm, I'm, And I'm just like, okay, why don't I know them? You know, you, you I know. think I should know these people. Who are they? So I, I messaged, and it turned out to be um, the guy who I've known, Alan, Alan Stewart, who... Um, his Twitter handle Don Jondo. I won't spell that because I can't remember how to spell it. Um, but he um, he and I kind of got together over a pint, and we said we'll just start a games club and see what happens. And that was come April four years ago, um, second and fourth Sunday of the month, East Nook Tabletop. If you're in Anstruther and you fancy going to the Chippy, then if the games club's on, everybody come, goes to the Chippy. Exactly, come and join us for some board gaming fun. It's it's going really well. It's it's because uh, the last the first session of the new year was just last uh, just Sunday there, um, which was great fun. Do you get quite a lot of regular people then? Do you get like new people kind of come along as well? We have we have um, a core. That's what I'd call it. So there's, there's a core group of people who come in almost every time. Um, then we have people who come infrequently, uh, but we also have um, lots of people who just turn up and they go, "Oh, I didn't know you were here." I mean, um, every so often on a Friday night, I I, I don't do this because I'm normally a dwarf and this is happening. But they have they have a role playing night as well uh, in, in the same club. Um, and there was a couple from East Weems who we didn't even knew nobody existed um, and stumbled across us and have started to come to role playing. And it's just like, okay. Um, so there's, I, I, 
the impression I get is that given the age of the hobby, and I know I keep using that phrase, but the age of the hobby, um, it is very much um, the sort of thing that you're getting people who are second generation gamers and indeed lapsed gamers who are rediscovering it. Um, so that second generation gamer uh, is either dragging their parent along who used to be a gamer or is just genuinely interested because they've heard their parent talk about it. Yeah. Or, or in the case of one of the guys who's who's been a, a kind of core member of of event for a, a long time, um, he had he had kind of stopped gaming in, in, in a real sense, um, or in a regular sense even. Uh, and when we started, it was like, oh, great! I can play my board games with different people now. I don't need to just play it with my family or or whatever. So, so yeah, that that that's worked out really well for us. So okay, as I say, you're doing this. You're cruising along. You're turning up at off on Fridays things seem to be going quite well and then you sit down one day and you've got to ask the question what possessed you <laughs> to think we'll have we'll do we'll do a conference um, we'll, 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 do, we'll call it Tabletop Scotland we're going to we're going to just go out there and invite all different types of people because it kind of there wasn't well there was probably rumblings within your mind for a long time that you were going to be doing it but what made you you know what was the kind of the moment that you sat down and you went actually you know let's let's do this and and you know there is obviously there's the glasgow games festival which is really nice there's there's edinburgh which is, is that compulsion yes, i think or it's being Ed- daft yeah you know, that, no it's compulsion it's run by edinburgh university student uh, gaming society um what possessed me uh, is that is the key question here i suppose um, it is yeah uh, so the, the, there's a point of history to this. So about four years ago is where the idea kind of started, um, and then after about three years of struggling to find a venue and struggling to find one that uh, met the very key t- criteria that I had uh, and had to be cost effective, um, so we looked at a couple of Edinburgh and almost signed a contract with one Edinburgh, but we pulled out of it because the financial risk was quite scary at one point. Um, so it became one of those things that I would just continually potter away with the idea, if I ever had a convention, what would I do? Yeah. And then I would go to Expo and I would see how they did certain things and see what I could glean from that and what I could see how they did certain things really well, like you know their seminar track that they're trying to build is, is intriguing. Uh, and I'd like to have seminars, and we do have a few seminars, just not ready to announce them yet. Um, mm. I think, and, and I then kind of took that viewpoint it's kind of early last year that uh, to plan a convention, and for those who don't know me, I'm a project manager by trade, so I tend to plan things. Uh, not, not necessarily to the nth degree, but I like to have a clear idea of when things can happen. And I started. What's your um? What is your favourite highlight colour on an Excel spreadsheet? <laughs> it's got to be yellow, right? Classic. It's got, it's got to be yellow. It's yellow uh, or not? It's yellow or not? Exactly. Give me yellow or uh, give me death. I mean, I'm, unless I'm really trying to show off, I'll go for the kind of neon green, obviously. But that's the, that's. The Would you ever go for like, say, a magento? Because I mean, um, is, there, is there anyone that uses that? Because that just makes the text almost impossible to read. Well, that's the thing. You do change the colour of text, but then you're, it's not really a highlight then, is it? It's you're changing the no. background colour. It's more conditional format, and now I'm sure of Excel knowledge. Because um, <laughs> everybody knows how to use Excel if they work in projects. No. <laughs> well, you probably do. I mean, that's what the, that's what the print certificate is, isn't it? Well, yes. <laughs> Let's face it. It's, 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 basically, here's it's two X, days of song. It's Excel 101. Uh, <laughs> it's two days of solid Excel. What do you mean I can do a formula? I can make these columns add together. That's crazy. A1 plus A2 equals. Yes. <laughs> I can't even do that. That's oh, you, get that you, can, you can. You just don't want to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it was funny. So I, I built a spreadsheet. Because uh, funny you say that. I built a spreadsheet of every <laughs> single games event in the UK. In the UK, not in Scotland. <laughs> I was only joking. And I know you were. Uh, in the UK. And, and I, I did it purely from the basis of I had two things on my kind of hobby agenda at the start of last year. One was to go to more events, and mm. two was to essentially either make the decision to do this convention or postpone it. Um, 
and um, I'll come back to the make the decision and postpone it in a minute. Uh, but the spreadsheet then became a kind of labour of love, and it's still going. It's, it's used on various Facebook groups. So if you've got any people who are on the UK board board game trading chat group on Facebook, run by Chris Bromley, mm-hmm. uh, it's in the the sticky there. That's that Google Doc is a spreadsheet that I've created, and it, and it has it's, what it's demonstrated is south of the border. You have an event for role playing board games card games of or or combination thereof every weekend yeah. practically there's one every weekend that's crazy and it's just like okay we have two in scotland why <laughs> why did we only have two <laughs> um so that that if nothing else made me go right okay now i know that i kind of have to do this it was a question of finding a venue um and i i kind of i'd kind of stopped hunting for a venue and then the debate with um, those I'm going to Gen Con with uh, started off, right, we're going next year, we're going next year. Right, this is 2017 at this point. And yeah. I was like, yeah, we'll com- I'll commit to that. So I, I, we booked their accommodation uh, to go to Gen Con. Everything was all sorted. And then literally the weekend later, my wife, who owns a, a wool shop in Putin Wien, uh, came back from Edinburgh, sorry, from Perth Yarn Festival and said, uh, you should go and have a look at that venue. I was like, what venue? <laughs> <laughs> the Jewish Centre in Perth. You can, should go and have a look at it. And I was like, okay. Um, so I, I kind of kicked John and nudged Duncan um, and just said, right, okay, let's go up to Perth. And I sent them an email and said, look, I'd like to come have a look at your venue. I have no idea what this thing looks like. Um, and John's been involved in this conversation for the past four years, right, about having a convention. And Duncan, he's been aware that I've been thinking about it for a while. And Simon's obviously been involved as well. He just couldn't come that day. So John uh, Harper. Sorry, John he's Harper. John Harper, who has been on the show before. He has, with a Greg, long yes. Time. yes. He was with Greg. on with Greg, yeah. Yes, yeah. he has. Uh, Greg's not involved in this because, just because it's Greg. Uh, <laughs> but I am going to Gen Con with him, you know. Or obviously he's coming with me. Yeah, that's more true. He's coming with me. <laughs> Uh, because I've I've booked the accommodation that's in my name, so oh, all right, okay. Um, uh, but yeah, so we, we went to the venue, and uh, on the way there, John's like, "Oh yeah, I go here every year with my dad." And I was like, and you, "The thing to mention there, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it's where the the model wheel show is." And I was like, and "You didn't think to mention it." Oh my goodness, so I was awkward in the car. That, that, was, a little, that was a little bit awkward. Um, but we walked in, had a look around, and within five minutes, I was like, "Yep, yeah, this will work." Mm. Um, it was great, and they, they they wanted us. And then within a flurry of two weeks, less than two weeks, um, we pulled together, dusted down all the stuff I'd done before, pulled it all together. I looked at the financials, started to really break it down and go, well, "Could this really work?" Uh, had some serious adult conversations as a group. Uh, went back to see the venue. And then initiated contract uh, discussions um, formally and went through that process. And then we signed the contract and then we went public. And that was, and I, I look at my spreadsheet as, as, as we're continuing that theme, uh, that was exactly 88 days ago that we went public. 88 days. That's all 88 that days. Doesn't sound that big a number, but it feels like if a you'd real been going, time. If you'd been going miles an hour, you would have potentially gone back in time. <laughs> but, yeah, oh, that's a good point. But, I mean, I'm not asking you to tell me cost, but is it quite expensive to put on a, a venue? Is it a sizable risk for you to rock up at a venue and go, you um, know? It varies, because the venue is just part of the equation. Um, yeah. It, the... I mean, a venue will come with certain kind of uh, bread and butter stuff like tables and stuff like that. But there's other things that go over and above that. For example, a board game, card game, role playing convention, you'll find needs a little bit more tables than a bowling event or a dance or a whatever. Yeah. Um, so obviously, as a venue, they don't hold that number of tables. So we need mm-hmm. to acquire X number of tables. And each one of those tables is an individual price. Uh, so all of these things can add up. You then go things like you need to have public liability insurance, you need, uh, and that needs to cover volunteers. You know, it's not just me and Duncan and John and Simon it needs to cover. It's yeah. the volunteers that we have as well. So it's it, there's there's more to it than just grabbing a hall, although you can do it on a small scale like that. But if you're trying to do something 
of the scale that we want this to grow into, you you need to put some proper thought into it from a bit of phrase. <laughs> and it comes are, with are, proper spreadsheets. Is it is it easier to plan a wedding or plan a conference? I can't really can do that. Me and my wife uh, did our wedding really on the spur of the moment. We just told people, turn up in four weeks, everyone's organised, come along. <laughs> um, um, which my mum is still not happy about. But anyway. oh, right. uh, <laughs> did you know? Did you know a thing of doing that for Tabletop Scotland? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Can you imagine that? So effectively, you are spending more time organising your tabletop event. <laughs> Then you are I your own wedding. You're doing that. But yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's terrible. Did you have it? a did you have a spreadsheet for your wedding? No. No. To be fair, more you people imagine? are more people are doing copy this than keeping my wedding. So that boy just imagine that. <laughs> That's a point of argument. Hey, you couldn't even be bothered making a spreadsheet for our wedding. <laughs> to be fair, I left most of that to Fiona. She's the more organised uh, uh, she, she reminds you that every time. Yes, she does. Uh, so do you I mean so. have you got to think about I mean, I mean, do you end up with a list? Because you're like, do you continually get surprised by the the venue guy saying, "Are you wanting tablecloths or not?" Kind no. of thing. Do you need chair covers? No. Do you need you know? Kind it's of weird. That kind of thing. It's one of those things. I think each venue is different. I think it's what I've learned. And one of the things. Well, I mean, we recently announced that UK Games Expo are a, bit, are a partner for the convention, and what they've the partnership arrangement we have with them is that they are basically my go-to people for help and advice and guidance and I spent um, an hour and 15 minutes in the forum with Richard and Tony and a big part of that was them going does he actually know what what the hell he's talking about um, <laughs> which which was great because I needed someone that wasn't someone that knows me to do that um, yeah. uh, and but one of the things that, that, that came up in the conversation that, that kind of struck a chord with me was they talked to, Tony talked about power quite a lot in the sense of how much are you paying for power? How much are you paying for per socket? And I'm like, I'm not. You know, it's part part of the, the, the rations with the venue. And he's like, I don't understand this. So I was like, Tony, you're dealing with NEC. That's why you didn't think about power. <laughs> I'm not dealing with NEC. <laughs> the you NEC's know? like across about three time zones, for goodness <laughs> well, sake. Well, exactly. It's, it's, it's kind, of get... like, kind of like, that's, that's why the NEC charges you for power, because they have to, probably. Um, you can but, get to the airport and you can get to the train station and you can effectively get to London <laughs> you're still in the by NEC. walking out the front door and you're still in the NEC, you know. And it's a great, it's, 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 but I suppose in some respects, overly talking about our partnership with them, but they are, they've come a long way because they started off in, a, in an event that they originally thought would have 400 people and had 800 people turn up to it. That was 13, 12, 13 years ago. So it's kind of like, I, don't get me wrong, this is not. This is never going to be as big as the expo uh, because I just don't think Scotland can sustain that. But you know, let's see where it goes. It's going to be around where my head is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, um, <clears throat> I mean, is this kind of spurred you on to think about other kind of events? I mean, you obviously you've the tabletop Scotland one, and we'll go into more detail about what you're going to be bringing to that. Has that kind of opened you up to thinking? Well, maybe there's opportunities to do it in other parts of the country um, is it worthwhile kind of partnering up with other people and maybe doing one that was slightly towards the border it's, it's interesting that because it's you're, you're, you're right there is something there, there there's nothing tangible yet but it's, it's the sort of thing that when I started to kind of speak to my network within the, within the kind of Scottish gaming community um, there was a couple of people who had said actually I was thinking about doing something as well but you're Far much further down the road than I was. Than they were. Mm. I was much further down the road than they were. Even so, they were like on you go, and that that is the sort of thing that you know to go back to the. There's only two a year in Scotland, or three now with tabletop Scotland. But it's like it would be great if there was one every month, you know, or or one every two months. You know, having six a year would be fantastic, yeah. and, ha- and having them, um, you know, geographically spread. Uh, ideally, because then it's you know, I mean, okay, central belts where I don't know seventy percent of the Scottish population live. But the beauty of a place like Perth uh, is public transport routes from pretty much it's, anywhere goes through Perth. Yeah, you I know. mean, it's pretty much a couple of hours away from the furthest point. You know <laughs> it's, I mean. it, exactly. So it's, <clears throat> but I think I I wouldn't rule it out, but I wouldn't. I knowing what I'm like, 
as um, as my team, as I refer to them, uh, know and have learned to know more, I wouldn't like to put my hand up and say I'll organise that. I'm happy to help provide guidance and support, um, yeah. which is what something I did when I had the shop as well. When I when I closed the shop, uh, a number of people who were looking at opening up brick and mortar stores who came to me and said, well, "What went wrong?" And, you know, because I want to learn from your mistake, and you know, I did that. Um, and I, and I would do the same. So if there is anyone who's thinking about opening, starting a gaming convention, as long as you're avoiding the months of August and September in Scotland, um, and maybe October, um, and November for Glasgow Games Festival, obviously. So, you know, you kind of want to make sure they're spaced out. And I'm, I'm happy to provide whatever input you want. Uh, yeah. Just wait until I've got this year out of the way first. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think in all honesty, I think, um, I mean, obviously you've got, um, Aircon. Yeah. Which is Harrogate, which isn't, obviously, you can't say it's like, you know, a million miles away. No, no. But the, and, and I guess, I guess the only thing that would, not, that would, I don't know, it's a little going to be in my bonnet is that there are so many content creators which are not, who are not based in London. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> that would love the opportunity to actually be sitting in front of a, you know, to be sitting in front of kind of certain game designers. And I know it's kind of like, well, you've got to have the audience there in order to kind of like attract kind of like certain names and stuff like that. But at the same time, unless you get your stick your neck out and, and, you know, you set up something kind of, you know, Newcastle, something like that. Well, yeah. And, which, and you know. Well, I mean, one of the guys who I spoke to at Expo, actually, last year, I was chatting away with him. And I think I was, we were both standing at the bar. Funnily enough, I was at the bar. Um, but the, <laughs> What day was it? Um, all of them. Um, <laughs> um, and, was it uh, three o'clock already? Yeah, well, and it was very much uh, just chatting away. This, this guy who was there playing Marley like role playing, he was like, I really wish there was something like this in the, New- the Newcastle area. And I just said to him, Well, why don't you start one? He was like, Oh, no, no. And I was like, Why not? <laughs> you know, because it is that kind of, well, if nobody else is going to do it, then, no. you know, I'll do it type thing. That's, that, that's part of the motivation behind this for me. Um, yeah. But do you not also think that when people think of expos, you know, when people are thinking of things like that, exhibitions, then people are thinking about the UK Games Expo, oh, yeah. thinking about something that's, you know, two halls wide. I mean, and they forget that actually when a lot of these places kind of started off. I mean, the Glasgow Games Festival was across, was pretty much across two floors. Um, so, you know, it, and it was still very, very busy. It was still a lot of fun. And I think it's, I guess... I'd be daunted to think I need to be attracting. You would think, well, how many? I guess it's like, well, how many? How many footfall is a good footfall? Is having four hundred people a good footfall? Is having eight hundred people have a good footfall? A, thing, a, a good footfall is one that doesn't lose you money, right? Yes, in, in simple business terms, and you know, it's it, this is a business discussion to an extent. If yeah. uh, you know, it's if you have to hire a venue to do something, and you want to not lose money out of that. Um, if you take the example of the tabletop day event that we had at Dwarf, which we'll be having again 28th of April this year, which I'm also organising for my sins. Um, um, but the, you got another spreadsheet for that? Uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I like I, the fact that it's not yet. I do have a, I do have, I do have a floor plan laid out for it, though. Um, <laughs> not in Excel. Um, oh, another, another piece of software. Um, but, but I took a um, mark for it. <laughs> Mark from Wreck and Rune Frame will be along. I haven't, I haven't reached out to anybody yet, so that, that's something I need oh. to do because we've only started. So this is a tangent there, right? So we, we've only just started cause basically because Greg's been nagging me uh, <laughs> to actually look at this <laughs> and say, right, okay, less than th- just over three months to go, I actually need to do something about it, right? Okay, fair enough. It's my idea that we're doing this, so I need to actually do it, um, which is fine. And I, I fully expect, I mean, last year we had. Uh, one for Yelf and Wreck and Ruin, Inspiring Games, and Bad Cat Studios uh, at yeah. it. Um, and it would be great for all four of them to come back. And if Keith McLaren from, um, with, I think it's Nuts and Bolts, is his game, uh, Cardboard and Coffee, um, if, if Keith wants to come as well, and all of them will be getting messages from me probably over the next few days just to say, this is what we're doing, this is when we're doing it, if you can make it great. I think mm-hmm. the thing with that event, I think what we were saying, is that had 76 people come through the door. And that was a success as far as I was concerned, because more than 50% of those people were not dwarf regulars. That is a success to me. And that's what you want. Yeah. You want kind of the inklings because you want them to come back. 
to yeah. the event. You want to remember the event for next time, and then come along as new, as new kind of fresh, and be, and introduce people to the hobby. Yeah, absolutely. Because we still we still need to be introducing people to the hobby. I mean, going back to the, you know, when you're running a shop, yes. it's all very well having the same regulars coming in, but you've got to balance up them coming in and hanging about with you and having a good chat and uh, not actually spending any money. And it's like, you're a really good mate in that, but I kind of need you. Well, and, and, that, and, that, and, it's, uh, and, and that was, uh, without making me cry, obviously, that, that was part of the, the, kind of the, the, the problem that we had with Kingdom Adventure was it, t- it ended up turning almost into a bit of a clubhouse, which was like, well, actually, no, this isn't what it's for. It's actually there to make money. Um, and some people, for some reason or another, don't like that phrase. But no, this is a business, guys. It has yeah. to be money. And this is, to be honest, it's the same with the convention. If it breaks even, I'll be happy. If it makes a little bit of a loss, as long as it's a little bit of a loss, I'll be happy. Uh, but ideally, it makes money. And then that means we can go to the next level for the next year mm-hmm. and then the next level for the year after. And it just enables us. It's never, ever going to make enough money. And um, you know, I mean, to to be a living, uh, to be clear about that, because I mean, if you look at Expo, um, it only now is at that stage that it's doing that, right? In the last kind of two three years, it's only yeah. now at that stage for Richard and Tony. Um, yeah. But for for this, this is this is a pastime that I'm filling all of my free time with that might make money to enable me to go right next time. We we do this or, um, as as. However, Richard or Tony, it was probably Richard that said it might fund a trip to Essen for you. Well, actually, what it might do is it might, truck, it might fund a trip to Gencon for me. No, Greg, that is not me saying I'm going to Gencon next year because <laughs> <laughs> he will use that against me. We're we're building up Greg to be some kind of horrific minotaur type character who walks, <laughs> who stomps about the corridors with his horns out of his head and steam escaping from his nostrils. There, there and he's just things, not like that. No, at all. a number of things I've written down in a message to him that he has then photoshopped or photographed and then played back to me six months later saying, No, you said this. And I'm like, Yeah, I did, didn't I? <laughs> Does he not? Because he tells me that he tells me before I ever speak to him, he says, "Now remember that all all conversations will be recorded." <laughs> that is a regret. You know, that is a regret. He's not. Yeah, he's not writing the kind of the. He's not writing the kind of the full thing. I mean, I take it selling. Is there? I mean, is there a point where you're like, "Well, is the break even point? You got to sell a lot of tickets to break even. Are you relying on a lot of footfall, or are you kind of? Do you have to kind of? I guess you've got a balance between." Charging people to have stands and making sure it's attractive enough to them, but also make sure it's covering enough of the cost. So the you know if you're getting good ticket sales, at least you can sit there and go, "Yep, this is us covered. Everything else is kind of like kind of gravy." Or is it is it quite close? Is it quite a fine line that you're getting to? There, there, there's a tipping point in the numbers where you get to. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's quite a difficult thing to explain without showing in some respects. But so the space we've got. Uh, is split up over there's a main hall which is 36 meters by 36 meters it's a pretty big room mm-hmm. um i can't remember what that is in feet people tend to ask me that and i end up having to look at a pdf that i've got on my laptop uh, so that's uh that's fourteen thousand square feet um there's a fair amount of space and, and on top of that we've got in our roughly five four and a half five thousand square feet in other spaces that we can utilize yeah. and, and, and if if we sell three hundred to four hundred tickets, everything's in the main hall. And that would be fine. Everything would work. Um, it would be in a in a space that it would still be a pretty decent event. What I'd like is for it to go a little bit more than that, and for us to then go. Well, actually, we're in the upstairs as well because it breaks things up, especially from a role playing perspective. So. From a call to arms point of view, it'd be really good if we sold more than 400 tickets. Not from a break-even perspective, but just to give a better experience for the attendee. Um, yeah. And and because it makes it commercially viable for us to go, well, we'll take that room as well, and we'll take that room as well, and we'll take that yeah. room there. Then everything's not in one room, and you can uh, you can hyph- hyphen you know, set, siphon not hyphen hyphen siphon certain <laughs> things off. Uh, like the role playing from a noise perspective, or the tournaments that we're having from a noise perspective, yes. you know stuff yeah. like that. Um, okay. So yeah, that, that's that, the. I mean, we we publicly talk about a number, um, and we privately talk about different numbers. 
Um, of course you do. We, we, we know how big this could be, and we know, you know, we know what we could fit into the space, and we know what we're comfortable with from a top level right. perspective. Um, but it's, it's stuff like that that you're kind of like, right, okay. But we don't need to be public about that. We just need, we need to see how our ticket sales are. And if they, yeah. if they go really well, then we go, right, okay, it's plan, it's the second plan, or it's the third plan. Um, yeah. Because, as I'm sure you're not surprised, they've got all these broken down and, and lovely floor plans. Uh, uh, are you using <laughs> Lilac? Like, do like <laughs> um, let me just check, actually. Let me open that Boomer Ranger. Oh, we could um, do. We could I have do a have Lilac. Lilac. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say who it's for, but yes. I'm genuinely quite um I'm quite thrilled that I got that one right. I'm also kind of disturbed. Uh, I thought No, not at all. You know. Lilac's a nice colour. And it's also light enough so it doesn't hide the black font as well, you know. Whereas red will be too glaring and also you'll look at it and be a bit scared and say, Why have I highlighted that and red? Yeah, you'll think something's gone. gone. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You're talking about space. What's gonna be in the space? What can we expect to See, I'm not asking for exclusives. Um, you know, I have some for you, but you know, it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, right. So, what did we? I suppose. Let, let me before I say anything more on on what I've got to share. Is is what did I want to do with this? And and some of this is me, and some of this is a team. Right. We, we had a vision of what this could be, and it was it was essentially saying I didn't want it to be X, I want it to be Y, right? So it was more of a, okay, I don't want it to, to, to just be this. I want it to be more. And whenever I say that out loud, it always feels like I'm criticizing someone. It's not what I mean. For, for me to want to run an event like this, it had to be something special. Otherwise, it was kind of like, well, why would I bother? Um, so we deliberately targeted certain companies. Uh, and Geek and & Son was one of those companies. Um, mm-hmm. And we were like, we really want you to come to Scotland. You know, because you've not been to Scotland, because there aren't enough shows in Scotland for you to want to come. So therefore, we want to be the first. And and they were so receptive, so supportive, and so interested. It was quite scary um, that they were taking this so seriously. Um, it, it, it helps. <laughs> Probably what it helps them, <laughs> that Duncan knows them, because Duncan right. has worked on their stand at Essen, because Duncan also speaks German. Um, oh, so right. it, it was really helpful that we had that connection already, but they still could have just said no, not interested. Um, <laughs> I just imagine, right? There was like there was a kind of a collection of kind of like wood shavings and <laughs> tools, and some kind of like tarpaulin and some cloth, and then all of a sudden the phone started ringing underneath, and it was kind of muffled. <laughs> People went, "Hang on, that's a Scottish phone." <laughs> We won't answer Somebody, that. Then. Somebody's <laughs> phoning from Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> they quick rip, ripping everybody off and went, they Hello? Do, they, do, they do have email as well. Um, <laughs> but but no, that's, it, that's better. It, it, All right, they, they, they kind of checked the dusty folder that had Scotland <laughs> inquiries on it. And I think, so within the space, so I'll, 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 see, I'll, I'll give you the first reveal that I've got here. So we... Uh, okay. We'll have, uh, as they're now called, as with the UK, there, um, purely from a demonstration pr- uh, perspective. So they will be running uh, between six and possibly ten tables of demonstration. The, the six to ten depends on a number of factors, but we've given them X amount of space and we've said, we want you to come and run demos, demos which is which is great. They do that a lot of shows. Do that at Glasgow Games Festival, yep. um, and that that's that's really good. I happen to know two of their demonstrators, and and also their organised play guy used to be my account manager. So that that's quite useful that I'm able to just phone him <laughs> and go, "You remember me?" Um, <laughs> exactly. He's, he's he's hating me right now. I think, but anyway, never mind. Because I've just asked him for so many different things. Because that's what they own the whole hobby, obviously. Um, <laughs> Um, That's I. I heard a figure to say today that the, even the turnover of Asmodee kind of pales, still pales in in, in insignificance compared to what Games Workshop are doing. Because Games Workshop seem to have pulled it out the bag, and if you can add up what As, Asmodee are doing and Fantasy Flight are doing and everything like that, then still Games Workshop are towering over them with their orc-headed axe and going grok. I'm sure, and, and well, GW is has had a resurgence in the re- oh, Renaissance yeah. even uh, in the last couple of years. 
Um, they're not coming. We are, however, hosting a Shakespeare <laughs> tournament. Um, uh, but that, that isn't an exclusive because I mentioned that and I'm lucky for all, And we've gone public with that. Um, right, um, okay. but the, G, so GW are, are, are very much, they've changed their model and, and okay, they're still doing their 40k in their fantasy or their age of Sigma fuck of fantasy anymore. Um, but they're also doing lots of board games as well. And Shadespire seems to have hit, um, that kind of hybrid GW board game player. Um, which sounds some sort of sci-fi movie from the eighties. Um, <laughs> but the, but that is very much how that, that attracts to us. Cause from a, a board game being quite simple about it, floor planning, right? Logistics. Board games take up less space than war games, um, yeah. which is why we're not doing war games in year one, <laughs> um, because we can fit so much more into the space. Um, yeah. So, what else is in the hall? That was going to be your key question. So, it was. We, we're so we'll have Geek and Sun with their big area, as with the UK with their big area. We'll have the three. We'll have two of the three retailers that I mentioned. So that will be Settlers Hamilton and uh, Big Dog Books in that area. Westian Games mm-hmm. are in a different space of the hall besides the role playing. Assuming the role playing is in a different space, which it will be, he says confidently. Um, okay. We'll also have, and I know you know uh, uh, Kevin Young from Inspiring Games, but Inspiring Games will be there. They'll be a sort of Scottish based game design company. Inspiring Games, they'll be in attendance with Legends Untold um, and other games they're going to have. They're going to be demonstrating Legends Untold, obviously. Uh, depending on fulfillment, um, let's hope, as a backer personally, let's hope it's out by then so that they can actually have the product there as well. That would be fantastic. Um, yes. There are a number of other publishers that I am not going to name um, that we are talking to two in quite advanced conversations with one, which I think will make people stand up and pay attention. The people some didn't make them stand up and pay attention. Um, so I won't say anything more about that because the people involved will kill me. Um, um, <laughs> you I don't mean, want to jinx I, it as well. I, I mean, yeah. I know, there, there is that as well. There is that nervousness with this. Um, but I mean, we're, we're going to, we're, we're aiming to have um, four retailers in the hall. So that's another two retailers to be revealed, right? Essentially, because we've got two in the hall and Ross and Westing Games will be upstairs because they're all playing. Now, two retailers in the hall, that's what we're aiming for. And we, we're confident we'll get those two. Um, because there's more than two that we're talking to, and they know who they are. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> we will have the uh, well, Bez um, from Stuff by Bez will be there. Um, we've got Kerry, who's tabletop crafter, so she'll have her, her stand there. Um, yeah. In the hall, we're also going to have uh, a games library, um, which comes to me, uh, come, brings me to an, another announcement. So we started looking at a games library. Um, quite early on and saying, well, how would we do this? Um, and it was actually something I spoke to Richard and Tony about, and they gave me a couple of suggestions, but none of those suggestions were a Scottish-based suggestion. Oh, right. Okay. right. I wanted okay. a Scottish-based suggestion. Um, one that wasn't me and Duncan bringing all of our games, basically. <laughs> uh, because that would have been <laughs> just that would just been a bloody nightmare. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I've made it somebody else's nightmare. Um, no, um, the Willa Glasgow Games Festival, in the 10 hours I was there, having only played um, about an hour's worth of games the whole time I was there, one of the reasons was for that was I sat down with um, Kenny Lee, who runs the Dice Roll Cafe, which is a pop-up games cafe in the in the CCA in Glasgow, and I keep forgetting what that stands for, um, Creative Arts, uh, Contemporary and Creative Arts in, in Glasgow. And... Kenny, I was that, thinking, I was thinking county court, no, or something or other, no, but that's because I'm a no, criminal. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> um, but Kenny, Kenny has a lot of board games, um, uh, so he's agreed to come on board and uh, no pun intended um, to, to, to do the games <laughs> library and also uh, to act as a convention partner. Um, so that ha- that's a relationship we want to foster and we want to grow and to help promote, help him promote the Roll Cafe, but also. As we as we grow as a convention, we want to sustain that relationship with him. So the games library will have currently we're looking at roughly two hundred and fifty, if not three hundred games in it. Um, we have more than that, but we're trying to scale this accordingly. We don't want to have five hundred games there and find that two hundred don't get used. Yes. Um, so it's kind of like so we're going for roughly two hundred and fifty. Um, which should be great, and that's going to not be a small amount of space that that takes up. So if you're going to have 250 board games there, 
how much open play space are you going to have? Yeah, so that comes back to the if everything isn't in the hall, yeah, right, then we can have probably in the region of 420 seats of open play, right? So that's for open play, that's just people sitting down and playing whatever they like. Um, so that's 420 seats, that's quite a big number. Um, so it's 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 giving a, a scale element of this this is what people come and do at these things they come and play board games so here's 420 seats for you go and sell them um and that that i think alongside the having having a games library of that size it's just another kind of big part of the whole it will give it its atmosphere it will give it its its purpose in certain respects as well as having the exhibitors whether that's retailers or publishers or whatever is giving it its purpose um I'm looking at the floor plan now to see what else I can talk about. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> exactly. No, I can't. I can't. I mean, it's it's essentially, true. if you think of the hall as combination open play and exhibitor hall, right? That's essentially what it's going to be. We're going to have a couple of other bits to that. Um, um, so, like tabletop Scotland stuff uh, with t shirts and stuff that you can get. Um, we're going to have a gateway element to that. So, there's going to be a team who. Uh, either as part of or as an extension of this DVM setup, who will be there primarily to help people who are completely new to the hobby um, and really just help them get on board with that. So we already have someone who's going to lead that. It's not one of the team. It's it's essentially an extended team member who's going to manage that and and look after that. Um, And and, and that's great. That's that's, that's something that we're really keen to do. um, Because coming to these things, if you're already a gamer, you kind of work in the assumption, well, okay, I kind of know what I need uh, and I kind of know what to do. And one of the, one of the questions we ask uh, when people buy tickets is how experienced are you? Um, and we want people to be honest with that. I don't want people to say they're complete experts if they've played Pandemic three times. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I want them to be honest so that we can then say, right, okay, our gateway capability needs to be X. So that helps us support them. Um what else? Um, and that, that's kind of the main hall. Um, over and above that, 15 plus tables of role playing games over uh, five slots. Um, so that's a potential. I didn't do the math beforehand. Damn, I should have done the math beforehand. Um, where am I? Calculator. That'll do. Six <laughs> times 15 <laughs> times seven. So that's a potential um. 630 seats of role playing game over the whole weekend. That's, that's not pretty unique. good. That's turnstile essentially. So you think about that. Yeah. Um, but per slot, that's fifteen times six. That's ninety seats of role playing per slot. Um, so that and we've got five slots uh, over the weekend. So it, it, it's that, that doesn't work. What have I done wrong? There, I've done that wrong. <laughs> no, I've not done that wrong. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, so <laughs> you can tell I'm doing that's something. Too- it's not on the spreadsheet. Damn. See you. I blame you. I've just erected it, absolutely destroyed it. <laughs> um, but yeah, have, and having 15 tables of role-playing is pretty impressive. And to go back to the beginning of this conversation, I am a role-player at heart, so that that's really important to me that we have a large role-playing thing. And when we yeah. when we secured the D&D Epic, uh, which has actually turned into more questions, than, 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 it's, there's a lot of excitement about it, but also people are going, what do you mean by an epic? Um, yeah. Um, and, and I'm happy to explain that if you want. But the ha- having the epic first ever D and D epic in Scotland again is one of those things that wow that's exciting because when I went to Gen Con in twenty fourteen, I went to the first ever epic, uh, and that was amazing. So to explain it quickly, an epic is a shared story across multiple tables where things that occur at each table can affect other parts of the story. Right, so the example I can give is the one I've played in, uh, which was 100 tables. We're not having that, obviously, at Tabletop Scotland, but 100 <laughs> tables at Gen Con, um, where you had people fighting against goblins in a certain part of a castle and other things. Um, but if the battle wasn't going quickly enough, i.e., the heroes weren't winning quickly enough, then the green dragon broke free and it did bad things. Um, and, and stuff like that so you kind of track people there's like floor walkers that move between the tables to see how are things progressing 
right, okay, we've got to this stage, have they achieved this? No, right, okay, this happens. And so you have this kind of mega plot that hangs around the whole thing. And it's really, really cool. I, mean, I, I, I loved it as an experience. And having um, uh, Ross, who owns West End Games um, in Glasgow, and Greg Foster, who's my kind of AL uh, Adventurers League, D&D Adventurers League coordinator, uh, managed that for me because I have to give it to somebody, otherwise I'll do it myself because uh, it, uh, it's close to my heart. But it's great that I've got people who know how to do this because Greg runs the AL, AL up in Dundee and Ross yeah, also yeah. runs it in his store. Um, and that in itself is just really exciting. Um, and it's, it's it's another kind of buzz thing that we've got for the convention. Um, well, I'm trying to think of what else. I've, I've got two more things that I can talk about from an announcement, but I'm conscious that I'm just rabbiting on. I know you're just letting me, but that's. But is there I just like I just like you. You sound absolutely, totally excited with us. I, I am very, I am. very, very, very good. What's the date? When's it going to be? Yeah, we've not talked about that, and and it's actually something I keep forgetting to mention when I talk to people. So, Tabletop Scotland is on the first and second of September. Um, 2018. Um, so it's the first weekend in September. It is um, the doors open at 9 a.m. on the Saturday, and they close at 11:30 p.m. on the Saturday. Um, so it's quite a late thing. And then on the Sunday, it opens again at nine o'clock, and the doors close at six uh, on the Sunday. Uh, some of the exhibitors will start breaking down about four o'clock probably, but um, but yeah, it's it's a, a long weekend of activity, um, and we'll be there probably not sleeping at all the whole weekend. Um, but you know, <laughs> what are you going to adrenaline and coffee? Um, but you know that that's that's part of the excitement and the, and the buzz out of it. It's um, having an event like that, and, and the venue itself. Uh, the Geo Centre, which is you know ten minutes walk away from the railway station, the park and ride, um, uh, at Broxton just outside Perth, uh, the bus from the park and ride stops right outside the venue, and we got informed um, uh, in a recent meeting with Perth Council that the park and ride currently only runs on a Saturday, but it's actually going to be running on the Sunday as well, not just for our event, that's something they're reintroducing in general, but that's, that's really, really good. Cool. Um, Good. So we're just waiting a bit more information on you know when is the first bus that sort of stuff. Um, the Paris bus station and railway station are both literally ten minutes walk away from the venue. Mm -hmm. The venue's mm -hmm. got four hundred parking spaces on site as well, mm -hmm. um, and there's various other options to park in Perth, and it's it's walkable from the town centre very easily, um, and it's really exciting. And really and really cool um, because um, when, when do when do tickets go on sale? So then? tickets go on sale. There's two key dates beyond the actual event itself. So 31st of January. So in 15 days, 15 days from now um, that we're recording this, uh, you can feel free to edit that later. Um, but 15 days. Um, Dave, I don't edit. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you about. know what? Top and tail. This with some music and just throw it out there. I take out any of the bits that I sound a bit stupid. Well, that's fine. That's fine. You that I'll leave stupid. in the spreadsheet chat. <laughs> Obviously, uh, don't forget the highlight agenda. Um, <laughs> but the, um, the ticket sales go on sale. <laughs> Tickets go on sale on the thirty first of January at eight pm or twenty right. or twenty hundred hours, depending on you like your twenty four hour or not. Um, the other key date is the thirty first of March. Um, so that that key date is when events start to be bookable. Um, so right now, and some of the one of the key questions I keep getting asked is why are you not selling tickets already? Um, um, and as I've already touched on, we've been public for what was it, eighty nine days or eighty eight days? Eighty eight days? I can't even remember. I'm gonna look at my spreadsheet. Um, <laughs> eighty eight days. Um, I deliberately, well, we deliberately, it's not necessarily, uh, decided that we'd go public and we'd build momentum and try and lock in some exhibitors before we start selling tickets because otherwise we don't have anything for people to want to come for. Um, yeah. So we deliberately did it that way. At the same time, um, from an event perspective, because our initial focus is on exhibitors um, and events to an extent, uh, we wanted to get as many events locked in uh, before the 31st of March to enable people to have a choice of what they want to do at certain times of the day. 
Um, if, if indeed they want to come to any of the events, they might just want to sit and play board games all day from the library, uh, which is perfectly fine. Um, or indeed sit and uh, inspire in games in booth and get demoed Legends Untold by Keb all day. That'd be quite amusing. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but I think the um, the event calendar piece is 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 quite key. It's, it's it's one of the it's one of the challenges when you're building a website for an event like this is getting something that works. Um, but to be clear, none of, none of the events, with one exception, uh, will be charged for. Um, yeah. Um, and that exception right now is likely to be the Catan UK qualifier uh, because uh, because of the nature of it, the price support. It's, for this, that, yeah. you know, it's official great. official it's tournament and stuff like that. You always have to hand over a, a, a bit of cash, a bit of something. Yeah, I mean <clears> it's it's. I mean the weekend ticket's fifteen quid for for adults. We've got a family ticket. We've got a young adult ticket, and kids under kids ten under come free. Um, so we've kind of we've kind of stolen, oh, sorry, borrowed um, UK Games Expo. Uh, yeah, 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 that's a very generous age, though. Yes, that's yeah, that's good because that does encourage. Because there's nothing like you know, that'll be two adults taking their three kids with them. It'll be thirty quid. If you go to any other place, it'd be like, oh, if they're over, if they're, if they're over, over seventeen months, months exactly, <laughs> to charge them as an adult. Exactly. Kind of thing. It's, and it's, it was one of those things we had, we had. We actually went around in circles with that a couple of times as a team, and it was like, well, actually, let's just look at what Expo, Expo do. Um, and and they they were they were fine with it. Um, so it's kind of like right, okay, we'll just do that. Um, I think the um, one of the other tournament events that we're going to have. So Catan won the UK qualifier. I've already mentioned here. Um, we've gone public with the Shadespire one, which I've also mentioned here. We're also going to have a Karuba uh, tournament, which is a game by Haba, um, yeah. who, as a German-based company, have been marvelous to deal with. Absolutely amazing to deal with. Um, uh, they are they're being so helpful with this. It's unbelievable. I wasn't expecting this level of help, and it was one of those speculative emails. You go, ah, they won't they won't be able to come. They won't be able to help us because they're in Germany. Um, but no, uh, they're 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 supplying us the copies of Karuba that we need for the tournament. They're providing us with all of the prize support we need for it, uh, and that's that's fantastic. Uh, it's just like excellent. excellent. Let's let's see where this goes. Um, but Karuba is one of my games of the last two years. So if you don't know what it is, it's Bingo Indiana Jones, um, <laughs> which is really the most rubbish description of it possible. No, um, but potentially it, it is. But it but it is Bingo Indiana Jones because one player calls a number on a tile, and everyone has to place that tile to try and get their explorers to the temples. So there you go. That's why it's Bingo. So there you go. But so there you what go. we'll be able to do with the copies we'll have is have a 32 player tournament of it and have someone, probably John, um, be the bingo caller. Um, he may or may not be an Indiana Jones or um, a bingo caller outfit, to be confirmed. Um, I think a bingo caller outfit. It might even be a hybrid. Uh, who knows? Um, <laughs> I'm sensing Britney Spears toxic. That's not an average of the so thank you very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> there you go. Um, if people have listened along tonight and they say, right, I want to I want to keep keep up to speed with what's happening with this fine with this fine event, where's the easiest way or where can we find you on the interweb nets? Right. So our various locations are, we have the website, which is ultimately the, the golden source of all information. If it's not on the website, we've done something wrong, um, <laughs> which is www.tabletopscotland.co.uk. Um, okay. We're on Facebook as Tabletop Scotland, so just the slash Tabletop Scotland. We're on Twitter as Tabletop Scott, because it doesn't let you do Tabletop Scotland, it's too long. And we're on Instagram as Tabletop Scott as well. And if anyone can tell me why or how to use Instagram effectively, I'd much appreciate it because I just don't know. <laughs> um, but um, we also have a MailChimp newsletter. And I, I bring that up because the amount at times, and there are times when we're bom- probably bombarding people with information because we have quite a lot to kind of communicate yeah. and share. Um, and what we do with the newsletter is we kind of backtrack over the previous four to six weeks and say, right, okay, we announced these things. Here's the just to make sure that if you're not watching our Facebook or Twitter or even watching the website as it changes over time, it's all in that newsletter. Um, 
because we don't want people to miss things. And it's not just the announcements about exhibitors. It's things like our terms and conditions for attendees. You know, it's just making sure that people have that visibility um, because I don't want to not communicate about it because um, that's normally one of the first complaints that people have is, you never told us that. Well, if, exactly. I've given, if I give everyone the opportunity to see these things, then that should hopefully be less of a problem. Um, so yeah, and we'll make yeah, yeah and we'll make sure that we um, we put all the notes and all the links in the show notes, so we've got notes to show. Exactly, because you need notes to show to have show. Exactly. Exactly. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, um, thank, you, thank you for coming on, sir. No worries. I do, I do have this one is, thing that I want to give you as an exclusive, right? What's that? What's that then? Yeah. Right. So when we start selling tickets on the thirty first of January. Um, uh-huh. One of the things we're going to be doing is essentially having some sort of raffle. We haven't quite worked out the mechanics of this raffle, but there are, there is going to be a number of different prizes. And one of the prizes is from Geek and Sun. Um, no, it's not a table before people get too excited, although I'll come back to that. Um, they're providing what they call a game night hamper, which is essentially it's a board game, uh, snacks, there's wine, um, there's various accessories and a Geek and Sun, uh, sorry, Geek and Sun accessories and a voucher as well for Geek and Sun stuff. Um, I did mention the wine, yeah, because um, that's important, <laughs> I think, uh, for playing board games. Um, but the and, and that's really really great, and it's a, it's a sign of the support they're giving us. Um, but then to go back to the table on the weekend of the convention, if you're there, so you have to buy a ticket, obviously, you can yeah. enter a raffle. To win a table over the weekend, wow, so wow. by the end of the convention, someone will have won a Geek and Sun table. How are they, they going to get it home, day? David? Well, it'll be shipped. How are they going to get home? To once they're on the bus, wherever they've come from, they're on the bus, it'll be shipped to them. You know, we're not going to ask they'll them. Never get that on the bus. Well, they'll never get that. On the could. driver's going to well, look could. at you and going to say, "You're going to have to pay for another adult." You might not be able to lift it onto the bus. To be fair, but well, I wouldn't. Certainly not. Um, <laughs> just imagine somebody saying, "I've brought my bike. <laughs> I've wrapped it up in really big cardboard. <laughs> Put one of those red, flashy, tingly, tingly, tingly lights behind it, <laughs> kind of thing, so the cars don't hit you. Get a proper bike light, mate. Exactly. But yeah, and that's really that's really good. That's that's again, that I can't thank them enough, even just for coming to the convention in the first place. But the level of support they're bringing is, is really good as well. So I just I wanted to make sure we got that. In. Absolutely. No, as I say, we will um, we'll make sure all the information that people want to see is proliferated throughout throughout the various media channels that we run as well. So, and as normal, we will um, will also be as the as we come up to the event, the first one for Tabletop Scotland. We'll, you'll be seeing kind of noise from ourselves as well. We'll be making sure that everybody is aware of the the good work that. Dave and the team are going to be going. To keep an eye on us, if you want to find out what we're doing, what we're up to, and where we're going, you can find us on Twitter, which is We're Not Wizards. You can find us on we're on Instagram. Just like Dave, we have no idea how it works. It's <laughs> photographs and stuff, but we just put that things up there. That is also We're Not Wizards. We're on Facebook, which is We're Not Wizards. You can email us, which is magic at we're not wizards.com or .co.uk. You can find us on YouTube if you go to youtube.com forward slash C forward slash We're Not Wizards Tabletop Podcast. Our, um, <clears throat> all of our podcasts go on YouTube because of Podbean, which is our lovely podcast host. You can find us on Acast, you can find us on Stitcher, you can find us on Spreaker, you can find us on Podknife, you can find us, you can find us on Apple Podcasts as well. If you like what you've heard, this evening, um, today. Thanks very much for listening. Um, it would be brilliant if you jump over to iTunes and drop us a quick subscription. Um, if you like us even more, feel free to drop us a rating or even write us a review. Now, as we say, don't give us 10 stars because that makes us big headed. But don't give us one because that makes us cry. Give us somewhere in the middle, like a five. Because it is average. And we are decidedly average. But who's not being average tonight is the rather wonderful, the rather fantastic, a gentleman who I've spent quite a few hours playing some cardboard with is the rather wonderful 
Mr. Dave Wright. So thank you very much, Dave, for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, there are only a couple more things to do. Remember, the first thing is that we are many things, but we're not wizards. Are, are we wizards? Absolutely not. And the second thing is to say bye-bye. So it's a goodbye from Dave. Say bye goodbye, Dave. Goodbye, Dave. Every single time. Walks like a charm. Uh, and it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a good... You're not, you're not the first person that's done that. No, I'm sure not. Can I just point out that, you know, when I say say goodbye to somebody, they always go, oh, goodbye. You. Okay. Um, and the second thing is it's a goodbye from me. But remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. If you're in Scotland, if you fancy taking a holiday, if you're in America and you're, you know, sick of going to American conventions, take a flight over to Scotland, to Perth, because it's lovely and it's got hills and stuff and it's got culture and castles and, you know, and it's also going to have tabletop Scotland going on as well. Um, and it sounds absolutely fantastic and we shall definitely be there. Um, obviously hiding our faces because we're not the best looking bunch in the world um, but make sure you make sure if you are in the area to uh, come and check it out because it sounds like it's going to be an awful lot of fun and you've also got a chance of winning a Geek and Sun table which you can't go wrong with that but until the next time my good people goodbye say goodbye Dave goodbye hey. <laughs>